And now after that wonderful opening session, it is my, my great pleasure to introduce to you the moderator for our second session, Archivist of the United States, Alan Weinstein. Welcome again. Let me briefly introduce the panel, although I think they're all well known to you. To my left is Professor Laura Kalman, who is Professor of History at the University of California at Santa Barbara, Professor Kalman. To Professor Kalman's left is Professor Doug Brinkley, whom all of you know. Doug is not only one of our finest historians, but arguably one of our most prolific ones. So he always has a book out, I don't know how he does it, Maybe at least one. And Doug, you're still a professor at Tulane at this point. And to Doug's... As a radio person, you guys speak into the microphone. Good. To, to, to Doug's left is the person who just told me to speak into the microphone, is my old friend Nina Totenberg. <laughs> and Nina is, of course, the very pri the prize-winning correspondent for National Public Radio on all affairs, legal and otherwise. And to Nina's left is Ambassador Boyden Gray, who these days, I want to get your title correctly, these days is the U.S. representative to the European Union. And uh, welcome to Boyden here. But also someone who's clerk for Earl Warren and who was a partner in a major law firm before this took, overtook him. Let me do two things. Let me sort of lay out, this is a very free-form panel. We know that by the nature of the, the subject itself. The, uh, the authors of this uh, subject decided that they would encourage us to uh, to tell anecdotes, or at least to tell inside stories, as I believe the way they phrased it in the, in the advertisement for the thing. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave it to everybody here, to, whether they want to tell an inside story or not. But I'm going to raise two questions just to see whether they will stir some debate in the room. <clears throat> I brought a book with me by someone I think some of you know, knew, William Rehnquist, and his little book on the Supreme Court. And uh, the former Chief Justice said at one point, that Webster's Dictionary defines the word pack, as in court packing, as, quote, to choose or arrange a jury, committee, et cetera, in such a way as to secure some advantage or to favor some peculiar, particular side or interest, unquote. Thus, a president who sets out to pack the court, Rehnquist says, does nothing more than seek to appoint people to the court who are sympathetic to his political or philosophical principles. There is no reason in the world why a president, he continues, should not do so. One of the many marks of genius that our Constitution bears is the fine balance struck in the establishment of the judicial grant. He then goes on to say, presidents who wish to pack the Supreme Court, like murder suspects in a detective novel, must have both motive and opportunity. <laughs> Here, even Madison had both, and yet even he failed. Let's talk about court packing a little bit and the definition of that. And has there been court packing since the famous court packing? But let's also raise a question that I've always been fascinated with. How do we describe, at what point do we begin to describe a particular court with the identifier of the Chief Justice or with one member whose court it supposedly is? What defines a court in terms of periodizing <coughs> the period, this very long period that we're dealing with. And I'm just going to let you talk about that or anything else you'd like to talk about given the period limitations. And Laura, we'll start with you. <coughs> By the way, you need not fill 15 minutes. <coughs> One uh, obvious question during the Truman-Clinton period is the increasing acrimony of the confirmation process. Between 1811 and 1894, more than one quarter of the nominees to the court were rejected. But from 1894 to 1967, only one nominee out of 64, Judge Parker, was rejected. The confirmation process was only occasionally contentious, as in the nominations, uh, nomination battles of Brandeis and Chief Justice Hughes. One might even argue that the Senate during this earlier period uh, in, for most of the 20th century wasn't doing its job. 
wouldn't the country and Charles Whitaker have been better off if the Senate had rejected Whitaker's nomination by Dwight Eisenhower? Whitaker was miserable on the court and had to be hospitalized for depression. It's often said that the Bork nomination rang in the modern era of partisan court confirmation proceedings in which senators, as Ted said, focused on nominees' ideology, with the implication being that it was the liberals who first borked a conservative nominee. The politicization of the confirmation process is sometimes considered the Bork battle's most haunting legacy. During every presidential election since 1964, fewer Americans had participated in the political process. But, as you'll recall, they turned out in huge numbers for and against Bork, and they watched the hearings on TV. Thus, Ethan Bronner suggested that the combination of declining voter turnout and intense interest in the Supreme Court that you see during the Bork battle left us with one overriding question. Have Americans relinquished the power to define what it is to be an American to the U.S. Supreme Court? It's a good question, but I'd argue that the politicization of the modern confirmation process began well before Bork when conservatives blocked Lyndon Johnson's appointment of Abe Fortas to succeed Earl Warren as Chief Justice in 1968. In the quarter century afterwards, four of 18 nominations were rejected, Fortas in 68, Hainsworth in 69, Carswell in 1970, Bork in 1987. One nomination wasn't acted on, Thornberry, and two were withdrawn, Douglas Ginsburg and Myers. And there were struggles over three others, the nomination of Justice Rehnquist as an associate justice and as chief justice, and the nomination of Justice Thomas. Rather than seeing the politicization of the confirmation process as a two-step process, as Ted White just suggested, I see it as a one-step process with the Fortis Chief Justice nomination in 1968 being the Rubicon. And the Warren Court has cast a very long shadow. When the Nixon, Reagan, Bush I, and Bush II administrations condemn liberal judicial activism, they use the phrase often as a synonym for the Warren Court. Conservatives depict judicial activists as politically liberal judges who ignore the Constitution's plain words and use judicial power to substitute their own preferences for the will of the people. Judicial conservatives, on the other hand, are said to practice judicial restraint, defer to legislative bodies, and to respect, rather than overturn, the policy choices made by Americans through their elected representatives. Now, without a doubt, the Warren Court was both liberal and activist, expanding civil rights and civil liberties. To conservatives, its activism reflected the political backgrounds of so many of its members. Warren had been governor, black senator, Goldberg, secretary of labor, Fortis, under secretary of interior. These were fellows who had been active in politics, who felt comfortable, conservatives said, transmuting constitutional law into politics. And the Fortis Chief Justice nomination hearings in 1968 became an occasion for rehearsing these accusations against the Warren Court. When Johnson had nominated his advisor and his attorney, Abe Fortis, to the court in 1965, the Senate had overwhelmingly approved the nomination. This was the high tide of American liberalism. Fortas and Johnson, of course, remained close after that. You can find a typical day in Justice Fortas's life on 
any White House diary sheet in the Lyndon Johnson Library. 8.30, Fortis might receive a call from Johnson about airline strike negotiations. 11.30, he might be at the White House for a meeting about Vietnam. Then to the Supreme Court for an afternoon of work, punctuated by telephone calls from the White House on the special red phone in Fortis's office. And finally, to the White House for a state dinner that might well feature entertainment that Fortis, an enthusiastic violinist, had arranged. Meanwhile, the F Warren court marched forward with Fortas's enthusiastic participation. As a Supreme Court justice, he joined enthusiastically in the Warren court's liberal judicial activism and wrote opinions expanding civil rights and civil liberties, including the rights of accused criminals. Well, by 1968, many had come to believe that the liberal approach that the Johnson administration and the Warren court adopted on race and uh, crime was not working. Though all presidential candidates tried to exploit the law and order issue in 68, as Ted suggested, Nixon did so best. The Warren Court became an issue, with Nixon blaming crime on the Warren Court and pledging that as president, he would appoint justices who favored strict construction. One of the many who listened to Nixon was Chief Justice Warren. That was why he went to the White House on June 13th of 1968 and handed Lyndon Johnson a letter reading, I hereby advise you of my intention to resign as Chief Justice effective at your pleasure. Clearly, Warren, a Nixon enemy, thought that Nixon might win the election and was terrified by the sort of law and order Chief Justice that Nixon would appoint. At their meeting, Warren told Johnson that he hoped that the president would appoint a new chief justice who shared Warren and Johnson's commitment to social justice. Johnson announced he was nominating Fortas two weeks later. Initially, it seemed that the Fortas nomination would be approved, but it was ultimately blocked by Senate filibuster. Candidate Nixon encouraged conservatives to oppose the Fortas nomination on the grounds that its success would mean a continuation of the Warren Court's liberal judicial activism. But Nixon kept largely silent about the Fortas nomination, limiting himself only to the general comment that the next president should name the next chief justice. Since Fortas was Jewish, Nixon was afraid that open opposition to the nomination would hurt his chance of getting the Jewish vote. And so Republicans and conservative Democrats in the Senate did Nixon's work for him, alleging that Fortas was a crony of LBJ and had, and had breached the principle of separation of powers between the White House and the judiciary by, com by continuing to advise Lyndon Johnson as a Supreme Court justice, though Supreme Court justices had long advised presidents. Conservatives, Republicans, and Democrats vociferously attacked the Warren Court for coddling criminals and protecting obscenity. Fortas undertook to defend himself in the court by becoming the first chief justice from the court's ranks to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee. There he perjured himself. He said that Lyndon Johnson had never discussed with him any matter that might come before the court, which wasn't true. He maintained he had attended White House meetings on Vietnam very infrequently and had said little at them when he had attended them often and said a great deal. Add his relationship with Johnson to conservatives' disapproval of the war in court. At one point, they berate him for an opinion that was decide, handed down seven years before he joined the bench, and their sense that they have a chance to change the direction of the court, and you have a recipe for defeat. Johnson's lame duck status and Fortas's identification with both Johnson 
and the Warren Court made his nomination too tough a proposition. So by the time evidence surfaced late in the game that Fortas had accepted $15,000 in lecture fees for teaching a summer course, money raised by his former law partner from Fortas's former clients, the nomination was already doomed. But the lecture fees were nails in the coffin. Like Bork's nomination, the Fortas Chief Justice nomination was defeated largely for ideological reasons. The experience with Fortas and other Warren Court members apparently turned conservatives against appointing politicians to the court. Interestingly, as John Dean tells us in his great book on the Rehnquist choice, Nixon himself did not believe that a Supreme Court justice needed prior judicial experience. Nevertheless, as conservatives called for justices who practiced strict construction and judicial restraint, they increasingly said the court needed justices with prior experience judging. Except for Powell and Rehnquist, whose nominations were the result of last minute scrambling by the Nixon administration, conservatives came to demand prior judicial experience, usually on the federal appellate court, except in the case of Justice O'Connor, in nominees after Fortas. With what result? The Rehnquist Court demonstrated that conservative justices can be as activist as liberal ones. It declared more federal laws unconstitutional in a shorter period than the Warren Court and cut back congressional power. Now, the only justices appointed between 1937 and 1967 who had prior judicial experience were Rutledge, Minton, Harlan, Whitaker, and Stewart and Marshall. Now everyone is expected to have it. In his new book, The Next Justice, Chris Eisgruber persuasively contends that prior judicial experience adds nothing to the process. When commentators criticized the Myers nomination because Myers had no prior judicial experience, I cringed. The Supreme Court's docket is almost completely discretionary, so the justice's job is very different from that of other federal judges. If the presidents insist on prior judicial experience, they should select those who have been state Supreme Court judges, like Brennan or Souter, because those dockets are also discretionary. My modest suggestion in concluding is that we recognize that the expectation of prior federal judicial experience is an historical accident related to the reaction against the Warren Court and stop talking about federal judicial experience. What Supreme Court justices need are legal skill and an understanding of the purposes of judicial review. Certain law professors, lawyers, politicians, journalists, a Justice Totenberg comes to mind, <laughs> scholars, and others, and others are Laura, as likely to- I'm a college to dropout, I can't do it. <laughs> are as likely to have these gifts as judges. Thank you. I think you'll agree we're off to a running start. <laughs> Doug, Doug Brinkley. By the way, people can, as they choose, go to the microphone or speak from, or there's, there's no enforced procedure here. Well, good afternoon. I want to thank the National Archives for holding this incredible event with all the presidential libraries contributing. And also, uh, one of the people in the front row who always does so much to promote not just Franklin Roosevelt, but presidential politics, uh, Ambassador William Vanden Heuvel of the Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt Institute. Thank you. And And I would be remiss if to say I wasn't slightly nervous to be talking in front of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and it's so wonderful for you to come here and be with us and listen to historians and journalists and legal scholars talk. So your, your presence here graces us uh, tremendously, and thank you for being here. <laughs> I thought I'd begin trying to uh, just sort of summarize a little bit of how presidents particularly recent presidents pick 
um, justices. And I, the anecdote I decided to start with is if you could cut to June 13, 1967, when Lyndon Johnson is in the White House. And he doesn't think he's going to pick Thurgood Marshall. And he thinks he is, then he decides not to. And Thurgood Marshall was generally depressed. He wanted the job. After all, it's 1967, and Johnson had just pushed through his 64 and 65 historic civil rights legislation. It would have been a crowning achievement to have an African American join the Supreme Court. But out of nowhere on the 13th, Thurgood Marshall got a phone call from Ramsey Clark speaking to his secretary, and Clark said, I want to see you immediately. He, uh, Attorney General Clark went, saw Thurgood Marshall, said, get to the White House. The president wants to talk to you. He sat there and met with um, Lyndon Johnson in the Oval Office, and they did just general chit-chat for a few minutes. And here, this is a transcript I was just going to read you for one second from Columbia University's oral history interview um, of Thurgood Marshall. And so this is Marshall talking. He said, we simply chatted about all sorts of things for a few minutes, and suddenly Johnson looked straight at him and said, you know something, Thurgood? And he said, no, sir. What's what? He said, I'm going to put you on the Supreme Court. And his immediate answer was, oh, yipe. <laughs> um, well, he asked for clarification, saying, what did you say? And Johnson said, that's it. And he said, OK, sir. Johnson had already had the press in waiting. So Marshall, Thurgood Marshall walks out. They make the announcement. And a somewhat nervous Thurgood Marshall, it all happened so quickly on him, um, said, well, can we please, can I call my wife to tell her this before she hears about it on the wires? And he said, you haven't told Sissy yet? And Thurgood Marshall said, I, I, how could I have? <laughs> you just told me. You've been with me every minute. And he dials, his wife gets on, and immediately Johnson grabs the telephone, as you all know he was apt to do, and says, Sissy, this is Lyndon Johnson. He said, yes, sir, Mr. President. And she said, I, he said, I just put your husband on the Supreme Court. And she said, oh, I'm sure glad I'm sitting down. And then Johnson got off the phone, looked at Marshall, and he said, I guess this is the end of our friendship <laughs> to Thurgood Marshall. And Marshall said, yep, just about. There'll be no more of that. And uh, Johnson was a little startled by that answer. <laughs> and, um, and he went on and said, uh, Thurgood Marshall said, well, look, you know, Mr. President, about Tom Clark and Harry Truman, they were as close as anybody. And then that whole steel controversy <laughs> came up. And, Tom had to really sock it to, to Harry, and it strained their friendship, talking about the Truman when he seized control of the steel industry and the Supreme Court had declared the action unconstitutional. And Johnson, at that point, looks at him and says, well, you wouldn't do like that to me. <laughs> and he looked at him and said, uh, yeah, yes, I would. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, and then no sooner than and sort of snapped his finger, I would turn on you like that if I had to. And Johnson looked, paused for a minute, and said, well, that's the way I want it. <laughs> now, w w whether Johnson really wanted it that way and whether presidents uh, really want a, a, somebody who's going to be independent-minded, somebody who's not a rubber stamp, um, is, is doubtful. Uh, Johnson probably wouldn't have minded a Thurgood Marshall that would be upsetting other administrations, but when you're president, you like to feel you have the court on your side. And in looking at these factors, when we pick who is our, going to be our nominee for the Supreme Court, I think you can get it down to a handful of general things to, to keep in mind at any given moment. And it, it doesn't matter what the administration is. First is the timing of the vacancy, the, you know, that moment when it suddenly happens. Uh, we have an election coming up. People are very, Democrats are pushing um, you know, Hillary Clinton, for example, very hard saying, you know, there may be two justices to fill, and if we don't, the right will have the Supreme Court forever. The timing of appointments, um, it's largely out of control. The composition of a Senate at every, any given time is a key factor. The, um, I think the president's public approval rating, and when they're popular, it's certainly much easier. You have, um, I think the, whether the attributes of the departing justice, who just left, sometimes you want to pick somebody who somehow is in a tradition of that particular justice. It's a consideration that gets weighed in. And the, um, finally, a realistic pool of candidates. We may have, 
uh, um, you know, as, as Nina just said, many of us adore her, but if she didn't finish her and, and ever be, you know, her schooling, as she said, <laughs> she's probably not realistic, uh, even though many of us would want her. Um, and so yeah, it you know. weeds out a lot of people. Incidentally, all of the Supreme Court justices have one thing in common, really. It's not in the Constitution. They're lawyers. By and large, I mean, that's what where people immediately you're starting to, to look at lawyers. Ironically, in the founding of our country, the, being in the Supreme Court was not considered that big of honor early on. In 1791, for example, John Rutledge resigned from the court to become the head of the Supreme Court of South Carolina, saying it was a more important post at a state level. And John Jay had been on the Supreme Court. Um, he ended up, of course, our first Chief Justice, John Jay. Uh, and he quit because he wanted to be governor of New York, which he thought was more important than being chief justice of the Supreme Court. When President Adams wanted to get Jay back, back in the court, his response, John Jay, was that the court lacked, and this is an exact quote, energy, weight, and dignity um, compared to being governor. So it changes as we know in 1803 with Marbury versus Madison in many ways for, the, for how coveted becoming Supreme Court justices. I won't go through all the different, you know, over 150 no people nominated for the Supreme Court. Sometimes they get rejected by so Congress. Sometimes they're withdrawn by a president. Sometime um, the, something will happen or it'll, it'll lapse in the Senate. But four out of every five of our nominations in American history for Supreme Court have been passed. Um, the, besides there being lawyers, we've been talking about these other considerations, ones that I think are, are uh, one that I think is becoming less prevalent is one that's been touched on today, and that's picking a major political figure to, to mark. It used to be you'd always hear it, and you still get rumors Mario Cuomo will come into the court, and it turns it doesn't happen as much, but certainly Franklin Roosevelt did that with Hugo Black, um, Senator of Alabama. He did it with Frank Murphy, governor of Michigan. There are stories about Dwight Eisenhower doing it with Earl Warren um, to, as a kind of a payback for backing him in 52. Uh, Certainly Warren Harding did it in 1921 when he had appointed William Howard Taft, who uh, went from the presidency to the Supreme Court. But the, it's been touched on by a few scholars today. You also see presidents sometimes making appointment decisions um, in a sense of bipartisanship if it's needed, usually if it's a crisis at hand. Uh, Abe Lincoln picked a Democrat, Stephen Field, in 1863 during the Civil War. You have FDR in 1940, has been alluded to, uh, with Harlan Fisk Stone. He also, of course, put people like Henry, um, or Frank Knox and uh, Henry Stimson Republicans in, kind of get bipartisanism for World War II. Uh, Eisenhower in 56, specifically when he picked William Brennan, wanted a Democrat, particularly a Catholic Democrat was the specification. Um, but I think this appointing of politicians is eclipsed in many ways. Today, presidents tend to choose those who are sitting judges. Um, you know, six, in fact, of our current um, judges were from federal um, courts beforehand. I think no longer is a um, nominees' political prominence more important than their philosophical compatibility with the sitting U.S. president and the legacy that that president wants to push forward. Um, the problems that, you know, with the Senate always having no real criterion, each member in the U.S. Senate doesn't have a rule for picking when a nominee comes from them. They can freelance it and do what they want. And you have moments where good people are shot down um, John Parker in 1930, Herbert Hoover had picked him, but he was considered anti-labor and was nixed. Of course, Nixon and having trouble with his two Supreme Court um, um, choices. And most famously in recent memory, as, as, as Laura has mentioned, um, Bork, um, Robert Bork, who was really rejected for um, philosophical reasons, that there was a, a need to kind of stop the Reagan revolution on the part of Democrats. The, what Bork brings to mind, though, is one reason presidents do want to have somebody that's like a rubber stamp. Comes out with, you can see a great story with Theodore Roosevelt. TR was a booming intellectual, loved to have the smartest people, uh, picked Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. to the Supreme Court. Um, 
And there, shortly, just two years later, Holmes voted against major TR antitrust case. And Roosevelt was so livid that Holmes showed, didn't, didn't, wasn't a rubber stamp, wasn't grateful. Here's Roosevelt's comment about Holmes. I could carve out of a banana a judge with more backbone than Holmes. <laughs> um, the, I think um, you get that, you see Dwight Eisenhower, I think this, this comment by Eisenhower, incidentally, on Earl Warren, that was one of my biggest mistakes I ever made picking Warren. It was a comment I made, and it's been, it's been used a lot. But there was, a, you know, Eisenhower's appointment of federal judges and Warren. He was very proud of a lot of that that Warren did also. It gets a little made, but that's another case of Warren in some ways turning uh, on Eisenhower. Certainly Nixon felt the pangs of that when um, a number of his judges voted against him in the United States um, um, versus Nixon when, with the subpoenaed White House tapes during Watergate. Um, the, one of the final comments I want to make, if you look, I think there were a couple of sea changes in this nomination process in modern times, which is what we're supposed to focus on. I think Truman, when you look at, Truman had four nominations to the Supreme Court, all of them he knew personally very well. Um, you know, Burton, Vincent, Clark, uh, Minton, they're all friends of his. Eisenhower, at 52 called what Truman's appointments cronyism. And Ike appointed Herbert Brownell to start establishing a criteria for nominations based in part for the first time on American Bar Association ratings and how have they operated at judge. That kind of scrutiny we're getting today, Eisenhower kicked in, yet um, Eisenhower wasn't pure on this either. He wanted to try to reform a kind of cronyism of appointing, yet he picked Earl Warren because he gave him political support. He had the, his next appointee or nominee, John Marshall Harlan II, was the law partner of Brownell, who was supposed to be doing the kind of screening oversight. And then um, he picked Brennan specifically because he wanted a Catholic Democrat at that moment in time. And when he went with Whitaker and Stewart, he was looking for a moderate to conservative, particularly wanting somebody from Ohio. I mean, so he had a kind of thing. So all of these factors, I think, come into the mix. What we can say, as historians, is that the Warren Court was a revolution in this country. And once the Supreme Court started with the Warren Court becoming a focal point of controversy into the 60s with all the sweeping things that it did, and you started by 1970s and 80s having a general trend among Senate committees which would intensify their scrutiny of presidential nominations. Um, they, they were no longer unhurried examinations. The Senate, in fact, this intense personal scrutiny became part of almost a mandate that a Senate Judiciary Committee would take upon itself. Um, I think because of that now, it's a very difficult, and because of these five, four decisions, we're at this place here where who gets picked means so much. The stakes seem so high that I don't know how people survive being nominated to the, you know, it's to be looked at every decision you ever made, any letter. People go back to ch childhood scribbles. You know, what movies you watch. I mean, it's become a very difficult, you know, process right now. Uh, and I, I do also notice a trend that I think you're starting to see younger, it used to be as, as TR's time you would pick a senior person by age. I think you're starting to get younger justices because presidents want their legacy to reflect decades down the line. They don't want to pick somebody in the court who might get ill or quit 10 years from now. They're trying to look at somebody who could be there for 20 or 25 years. Thank you. I'll probably talk plenty today too, but not right this minute. I do think all's fair in love, war, and journalism, and therefore that Justice O'Connor should be able to get on National Public Radio this evening and give her account of what I say here today. <laughs> Seemed. Um, it's so difficult, I think, to compare the nomination process in different periods of time and to peg what the reasons are for those differences. There's no question that it's very different today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, 
75 years ago, we didn't even have people appearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee. I think the first time was in the 1930s. So everything's different. Our mode of communication, our instant communication is different. But you can tell one thing, and that is that if a president does not want to have a big confirmation fight, he doesn't have to. I say he because so far we haven't had a she. Uh, there are ways to avoid it. There's a famous story about the nomination of Justice Cardozo, who uh, the president, President Hoover, showed a list of potential nominees or people he was considering to, I think it was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And uh, the chairman said, well, the list is fine, but it's upside down. Cardozo had been last, and Cardozo got the nomination. Uh, President Clinton was toying with the idea first of Cuomo, who eventually turned him down, uh, then with Bruce Babbitt, and Senator Hatch told him that while he couldn't be sure that he would be defeated, it, there would be a lot of votes against Babbitt, particularly from the West, where there were people who very strongly disagreed with his policies as Secretary of Interior. And therefore, and so Clinton said to Hatch, well, who would you suggest? And Hatch, by his own statement, said, well, I, I think you would have no trouble with either Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Steve Breyer. And in the end, Cl Clinton decided he didn't want to expend his political capital on a, on a Supreme Court fight, and he picked those two, first Ginsburg, then Breyer. And then, too, the body politic is so different today. If you look back at the Hainsworth confirmation hearing, I should have checked these numbers, but my recollection is that there were, guess how many Republican votes against Hainsworth? I'm not saying that they were right. I'm just saying, how many were there? You figure five, 10, no, 15, no, 19 Republican votes. There were, as I recall, 11 votes against Carswell. Uh, Bill Coleman, who um, would become the Jerry Ford's Secretary of Transportation, was then lobbying against Carswell, and he went to see the then Republican leader, Hugh Scott, who had already voted against Hainsworth. And Scott said to him, look, I can't vote against Carswell. I'm the minority leader. I'm the president's leader in the Senate. I can't do that. So you can't expect me to do that. But I'll tell you where the votes are. <laughs> so, uh, so he helped him defeat Carswell without himself voting against Carswell. I, those numbers just don't exist today. There's a much more clearly divided body politic between Democrats and Republicans. There are very few genuinely very conservative Democrats, and there are very, very few genuinely moderate to liberal Republicans. They just, those are animals that don't exist currently. And so to compare that time with now is in some ways fruitless. What will change it? You know, uh, we, Alan started out with quoting from the late great Chief Justice Rehnquist's article about presidents considering uh, trying to pack the courts and that they should do that if they possibly got the opportunity and, the, and had the motive. The danger, of course, is that the Senate will do it back to you. And in some respects, that's what happened to President Reagan and Robert Bork. President Reagan had a very announced agenda for what he wanted in a justice at that moment. When he named Justice O'Connor, he was very clear about the fact on the campaign trail that if he had the chance, he would name the first woman to the court. And although there were people who tried to talk him out of it, when he got that chance, he didn't wait. He leaped at it. And because of that was a different era in American politics. Um, there really were very few Republican women or probably women on the bench at all to choose from. I'm not denigrating Justice O'Connor. I'm only saying that 
she would be and has been the first person to tell you in her own books that she wasn't the best qualified person in the country. I would argue that she was in some ways, but she certainly wasn't the most experienced. And, but he picked her. He met her, he liked her, he saw what kind of a justice he thought she would be, and that was good enough for him, and he picked her. And then he moved on to his next nominee, and that was Borg. And by then, there was a fairly long checkoff list of subjects on which the president wanted assurances what kind of a nominee he was getting. And that was based on his experience in California when he didn't pick people who'd been on the courts to the state Supreme Court, and he got burnt a couple of times. They, people turned out not quite like he expected. He wanted some predictability, and that was the way he thought he could be assured of it. But when you say that out loud and you pick somebody who is pretty far to one side, you have to figure that if the other side of the political debate controls the Senate, they're going to push back. And that's exactly what they did. And finally, on the subject of why presidents pick nominees and the peculiar reasons, one of my favorite stories was the choice of Abe Fortas to sit on the Supreme Court at all, not his nomination to Chief Justice. And the story which maybe my mind is playing tricks on me, but I think Abe Fortas told me this story when I went to see him as a rather young reporter and batted my eyelashes at him. And the story is that Johnson had to send 50,000 more troops to Vietnam. And Fortas was very ambivalent about going on the court. I think he really wanted to, but it meant a severe loss of income, and his wife was not pleased about that. And uh, Johnson called him in and he said, Abe, I'm sending 50,000 more troops to, the, to Vietnam today and you to the Supreme Court, so you'll be the headline. So, well. so with that, I think I'll quit while I'm ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Nina. As long as we're throwing in stories about uh, government jobs, there's the famous Truman story of uh, the fact that uh, he said that every time that he appoints someone to the court or anything else, he makes 99 enemies and one ingrate. <laughs> <laughs> I want to return to that theme in a second, but before we do that, I, I do, really didn't do justice. We're very fortunate to have, in addition to these extra extraordinary academics and journalists on the panel, someone who's actually helped to appoint judges at one time or another probably in his life. That's Boyd and Gray, who was, uh, after he himself was a clerk for Earl Warren for a long period of time. He was White House counsel in the administration of President George H.W. Bush, having previously served for the Vice, Vice President Bush. And so Bo Boyden, the benefit of your experience in this process, I mean, what, 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 have, what have we got right, what have we not got right? Um, well, out of solidarity with me, I will not stand up. I'll be non-academic about this. Um, uh, I can't resist some anecdotes because people have been telling anecdotes, so I have to tell counter-anecdotes. <laughs> and um, I did clerk for Warren, and he would tell us that so we would have these wonderful Saturday lunches with his law clerks. And one of the more amusing stories was about Whitaker, who's come up, who had nervous breakdowns, and he would say that Whitaker would sit there in the conference, which is where the ju justices decide what, what cases to take and how to resolve them. He'd sort of say, well, if I vote for the petitioner, the respondent will be upset. <laughs> and, but if I vote, but the respondent, the petitioner will be disappointed. Um, then you, then there, was, there were rating, rating systems that would go out, uh, sort of like a, a Americans uh, a conservative this or liberal that. And, he, he would be rated 80% uh, 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 conservative, um, you know, very highest rating. You know, but Douglas apparently was much, much lower. But he'd go around with this little slip of paper saying to the, to, to the other justices, do you really think I'm 20% communist? <laughs> uh, um, um, I see Senator Sarbanes here, and I'm, I'm tempted to tell this maybe totally apocryphal story about how Breyer got appointed. Um, uh, they're in the Oval Office. Everyone's waiting out in the Rose Garden for the announcement. And Clinton starts talking with Breyer right there. Uh, and Lloyd Cutler, of course, uh, 
being the, being the White House counsel, you know, it would be interesting if we put Sarbanes on the Supreme Court, then we could put Smoke, who was in the mayor of Baltimore, into the Senate, and then a whole bunch of things could, 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 could flow from this that would enhance the vote in the Senate. And apparently Cutler said, Mr. President, you are going right now to the Oval Office to announce Judge Breyer, and <laughs> grabbed him by. Um, uh, then there's a the story of Brennan. Uh, maybe there was an Irish Catholic he wanted, but I'm told the story partly is that uh, Brownell had one of his staff go um, uh, to check him out, and he heard him give a speech. And it was a law and order speech, and it fit with the profile. And uh, they were very, very thrilled. But what happened was that Brennan actually was substituting for his chief justice. He was in on the New Jersey Supreme Court, and he gave the speech that his chief justice would have given. <laughs> it wasn't his speech. Um, then there's the story of Goldberg. Uh, being talked off the court so that uh, Johnson could put um, Fortas on the court. And I'm told that the reason was, and, and Goldberg bought it, can you believe that? Um, uh, that he wanted to get Fortas out of it because Fortas was lobbying and using his name and just, you know, creating all kinds of problems for Johnson. So he, Johnson kept saying to Fortas, I want to put you on the court. And Fortas would keep saying, you know, it's like St. Augustine, uh, Mr. President. You know, oh, Lord, make me chase, but just not now. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but eventually it worked, and uh, of course it did get Fortas in trouble uh, because Fortas eventually had to leave the court, and I don't think, I'll kick back this, I don't think that was the Rubicon, uh, really, um, but um, there, there are, then there's the story. It is true that Holmes didn't follow what, what Roosevelt wanted him to do, but they remained very, very good friends, and then there's the story of the, of the wedding of Alice Roosevelt, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, and uh, this, well, it was a social organization that had a certain... Uh, Cambridge University, um, and they were both members of it, and which is partly why they were friends. Um, but the wedding was a was a wedding of this particular uh, occasion. I'm told that Roosevelt told his daughter, "You only have you, you you have to marry someone who's in this organization who's also in politics." And there's only one person who qualified, and that was Nicholas Longworth. So it was a wedding, and and the and the and the steward of the club presided over the punch bowl. That's what he would do at these weddings. And Holmes was at the wedding, all the, you know, and he sees the steward, who, whom he loved, who was black, and he goes out, uh, leaves the, the, the receiving line, uh, uh, the wet line waiting, and goes and hugs for quite a lengthy period of time. And apparently, uh, foreign diplomats' wives were fainting in the receiving line because they had never seen uh, such a spectacle. Um, I could go on, stories are really great. Um, uh, that you pick up when you do this job, of, uh, which I had, of helping pick judges. Uh, I don't think uh, Fortas was the Rubicon. I think, I think it was Bork. Uh, I think, as uh, Alan Brinkley has said, uh, uh, Douglas Brinkley, I mean, that, that four out of five made it, but one out of five has been kicked out by the Senate uh, over the course of the last 230 years. It isn't just recently. What's happened recently uh, is the spectacle of the hearing process and the pu public campaign and uh, all of that that attended the Bork, uh, uh, the Bork and also Thomas um, uh, uh, hearings and then the use of the filibuster, uh, uh, which, uh, which, which was uh, also very, very controversial. And the issue, so far as I can see it from my days and then having to testify many, many times, not many, but several times in Congress about this issue, um, is whether judicial philosophy is a grounds for either picking and or rejecting uh, a Supreme Court nominee. And arguments when, when I was in the White House about uh, advising consent and the uh, Constitution, th I think, says um, uh, the president shall uh, nominate and with the advice and consent of the Senate appoint, advising consent, uh, modifying appoint, not nominate. Um, but that was, that was and has been an argument. Um, is philo philosophy uh, a grounds for rejecting? Um, many, many arguments about that. One of, one of the more amusing occasions was when uh, Senator uh, Schumer, uh, I don't think Senator Sorbanes was there at this particular occasion. But Senator Schumer had a set of hearings about this question of can philosophy be used as the grounds for rejecting a Supreme Court nominee, and I was paired with my then partner, Lloyd Cutler, uh, uh, he to be the liberal and I to be the conservative. And what the staff hadn't realized was that there were, wasn't any difference in view between um, Lloyd Cutler and me, or there wasn't any difference between me and Lloyd Cutler, I should say, 
Um, but Lloyd had long track record of saying philosophy was not a, a, a legitimate criterion for rejection. So it was very frustrating for Senator Schumer to hold this hearing with Lloyd and I agreeing about absolutely everything. <laughs> I, don't, I wonder how long that staffer lasted. Um, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, this, this has been, the, I think, the, the, the single um, biggest, uh, biggest issue. And from my vantage point, I suppose it's because I'm a conservative or a Republican or maybe even a libertarian, some would say, that I think it's, uh, it's been, since the fights have been ugliest uh, on the, uh, by the Democratic side, in my opinion, and I'll get back to Fortas in a second, um, the question has been, is the court there to, to, to do legislative type work? And it's a complicated argument because, as has been pointed out, um, the, um, the, the Republican nominees, or at least the conservative ones who've survived that way, have, have tended to throw out more um, legislation than uh, Democratic nominees. So it complicates uh, the argument. Who, is, who are the judicial activists? So it's a very, very rich, a very, very rich argument. And uh, people like Mike McConnell can write about this much better than I can, and the historians can too. Uh, but I would say on balance that uh, the, the, the issue has been in the modern period um, is the court to have this sort of quasi-legislative uh, function and the, and the presidents that I know about and, ha and have served have always said the nominees should really not be making, should not be making law. And I may be, I, I know I'm oversimplifying and I'll get pushback from the panel up here and from people in the audience, but that's the way uh, many of us have uh, have uh, seen it. On the question of Fortis, I, this is a personal, uh, has some sort of personal um, uh, relevance to me because I was scheduled a clerk for the Chief Justice. And those of you who've done this job of clerking know that it's, I mean, it's it's, it's the most exciting life is downhill ever after. Um, even even being White House Counsel was downhill, uh, and it's a marvelous experience. And you don't want to lose it. Well, if Fortis had been confirmed, I wouldn't have been. Um, uh, uh, Warren's law clerk, or at least he wouldn't have been chief justice. Um, and so it was something I was paying a lot of attention to at the time. And uh, John, uh, Fortas, and, and Fortas also was a classmate of my father's at the Yale Law School, and my father was very fond of him and always thought that, um, that Fortas was the smartest man he ever knew. And uh, because of his friendship with Fortas and uh, Paul Porter, I, my first job as a, as, a, as a sort of a summer associate was at uh, Arnold, Forrest, and Porter. So th there is sort of this, uh, this, this sort of this personal ties here, but Forrest was on the floor for only about five days, and they had a test vote. He couldn't even get a majority, let alone, you know, Buffy with about 48 votes is all he could get, and within uh, six or seven hours of the vote, he uh, had withdrawn his name from consideration. Uh, normally in those days, a filibuster would entail um, a half a dozen uh, uh, cloture votes, uh, usually with uh, uh, the, the, the pattern then was uh, on the fifth or sixth, sixth vote, they'd get cloture because the people who were, who were for extended debate believed that they had extended the debate, and now uh, the majority was entitled to uh, have an up or down vote. But he never even tested the system beyond uh, four or five days. Um, and you know, we know how long these these matters hang in the air uh, today. I hope that we'll get back to the point where, uh, you know, Lloyd Cutler would, would say philosophy is, is not uh, a grounds for rejection. It is a grounds for picking a president. Is that's what he's authorized by the Constitution to do. And um, we ought to uh, take the Supreme Court a little bit more out of politics than it is. Uh, we can't expect that much of it. It, it cannot sustain. Uh, that kind, that level of politicization, in my opinion, and so I hope the whole thing cools down. Maybe with the confirmation of Roberts and Alito, without a whole lot of uh, of a fanfare, uh, that we are back on the road again to being a little more sensible about this. Thank you, Boyden. <clears throat> <clears throat> Before we turn to your colleagues, let's just take stock of where we're at at this point. Thank you for that analysis of the reasons for the way in which people are chosen to, for, to, to the Supreme Court these days. Apparently, there, one would summarize that as the damnedest collection of reasons because there's been no, no single reason there. Now, we have an argument over the Rubicon. Some of you think the Rubicon was crossed with the 
Ford is, how many of you think it was crossed with uh, Bork? How many, how many of you think it was crossed with Bork? I'm, I'm Bork. I don't know. You're, you're, you're Bork? I think it's a combination. I don't think it's that simple, unfortunately. No, nothing's I'm, that simple. I'm, I'm just trying to derive the rationality that we can derive from this process here. By the way, the, the line in terms of your nomination is getting longer out there. They, they do want to talk to you. <laughs> so, um, the reason I think the Rubicons with Bork um, and not Fortis is, um, you know, Fortis went forward, Bork didn't, and it's the rejection of a career of a man like Bork and, and what it did to him personally um, that started, I think, kind of the corrosive politics. I'm not saying that people that went after Bork were the reason for it, but I do think it was a, a sea change because so you look at Clarence Thomas's Mr. Gray knows well, I mean, they, what happened with, them with Clarence Thomas and all, it started a kind of uh, a circus trial, I think because the information age was clicking in in the 80s. I mean, when it was the beginning really of the, the, the ability to find information on people um, in a way that hadn't been as, as easy. After all, it becomes the era of DNA suddenly in the, in the but 80s. But then, so, yeah. then why not Haynesworth? I mean, Hainsworth was squarely <laughs> rejected, and he was overwhelmingly rejected, and he didn't leave the federal courts, and he didn't, he re remained a very respected judge, and it didn't sort of, it didn't do the It wasn't a spectacle. It wasn't a spectacle. It wasn't a spectacle. There with, with, with Vietnam and, and the anti-war protest in Cambodia and Laos, it kind of stayed, except for real watchers of the court, is, is just only modestly big in breaking news, where Bork kind of, I think, just blasted the country wide open, and I'm not sure we've recovered from, um, from Bork and Clarence Thomas's experiences. Historians always try to push things farther back than anyone wants to push them back. So maybe I'm wrong about Fortis, but I think that the Fortis Chief Justice nomination was a circus. I also realize that reasonable people can disagree, but you know, both Bruce Murphy and I think that there was a filibuster, but I realize not everyone. But, you know, I think one of the things that if you've, I hate to admit this, been around as long as I have and covered as many confirmation hearings as I have. First of all, I think Justice O'Connor's hearings were the first where television cameras right. and microphones were actually allowed in the room. So when I first, the very first one I covered was Portis. And people would come out of the hearing room and like, for example, a guy like Tunney was very good at sort of summarizing what had just happened. So you could get a sound bite out of him. And that's why he, he was highly prized Senate material at that moment. But when, you, when, you covered that, when you've covered that many, wh what I saw when I was a very young reporter, very young, incredibly young, um, How young? was that <laughs> And if you read the transcripts of the Marshall uh, and the Brennan and the Stewart here at confirmation hearings, we forget that there were Dixiecrats then. And they were on, often on these nominations. And that's part of the Fortis story, is that they weren't particularly interested in confirming Fortis to Chief Justice. So in the 50s and 60s, and even the 70s sometimes, they, in the 50s and 60s, they were clearly just sort of beating on people because of their uh, previous decisions, because after all, Stewart and Warren were recess appointees. Their previous decisions about race they were just beating the holy bejesus out of them. But they were only a few of them. So that didn't work. And so the next thing was that the law and order questions, which were legitimate questions after all, became for the Dixiecrats sort of surrogates, a surrogate issue. So you had Strom Thurmond saying to, I think it was Abe Fortas, Miranda, 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 I want that word to ring in your ears. Mallory. Mallory, Mallory, Mallory you're right, Mallory. Sorry, Jack, that was Jack McKenzie telling me, correcting me, Mallory. So it was, it was very complicated. I, I think the Fortas vote or non-vote was a filibuster, but I also think Boyden is right. Fortas didn't have the kind of support that would have been needed to block a full-fledged full filibuster, and everybody understood that very qu quickly. Once Senator Griffin said he was gonna filibuster, the Southerners weren't gonna help, 
And even the good government people sort of smelled a rat. I mean, the Phil Hearts of the world smelled a rat. I, I should add, which I did not think, say before, is one of the things that was operative in the Fortas case, I and mean, he just didn't get enough votes to even to get, he didn't get 50 votes, let alone 60, uh, on that first test vote, and he was gone. Uh, he pulled out, and a filibuster is something that lasts more than sort of two or three days, believe me, uh, then and today. Uh, but what I didn't say, what, what was an undercurrent was the scandal, not the fact that he was a crony of Johnson's, but that he was a crony of a lot of people who were, buying, who were, who were creating huge conflicts of interest for him. And of course, I was then, luckily, clerking at the time that he had to be talked off the court, and Mitchell went to uh, uh, Warren, and Warren wouldn't tell us what Mitchell told him, but he did tell us that Mitchell was quite gracious about it and said, look, there, what you know about is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to lay out everything. And you have a choice of talking him off gently or blowing the court up as we make this stuff public about what he's been taking under the table. Now, the public doesn't know about what he was taking under the table. I never found out about it. But this was already un an undercurrent when he was rejected and he pulled out uh, in, the, in September of uh, 19, whenever it was, 68 or 9. But let's, let's leave Abe Fortas, may he rest in peace, <laughs> uh, to his legacy. Let me ask you, before turning to audience questions, I have one question for all of you. Has it occurred to anyone other than me here that uh, people, that one of the things that happens is that you, you, people get nominated because they're supposedly X or Y. They have certain ideologies that get them the nomination. They get confirmed, they go into the court, and lo and behold, they're profound disappointments to people who nominated them because they're not playing X or they're not playing Y. They're not, they're not, they're not behaving according to the type they were supposed to be behaving. This, first of all, why if the, is that the case? And secondly, why is that the case? Now, there, there are some exceptions, but I think increasingly, there's, one could almost talk about the attitudinizing of the court, the individuation of court justices. It's very hard, it's very hard for people to, uh, to play a role if they feel they don't have to play a role. Institutionally, they, they, they get caught in a whole other set, set of imperatives. Does that make any sense to anybody except me? Well, there, there are a lot of famous cases of people who voted in ways that right. you've heard some of them. Sure. But I, I think I'd argue that um, presidents in modern times, with a couple of notable exceptions, have been pretty successful yeah. at predicting the president at, at predicting what kind of people they were nominating. And the, usually, I think President Reagan was right. If you had somebody who's on the court, on a federal court for a long time, you can see what kind of a judge that is, and you're you're not going to get a surprise. And the obvious different person like that is Justice Souter, who had been on the federal court for about 14 seconds, but he'd been on a state court for a long time. And I've always thought that this was the um, hubris of the chief of staff, Mr. Sununu, who thought he knew him. And you know, I nominated him to the state supreme court. I knew, I know him, and. And he was not as conservative as President Bush, I think, may have thought when he nominated him. But by and large, yeah, I don't think that Justices Alito and Roberts or Justice Thomas or Justice Scalia have been any surprise at all to the presidents who appointed them. And I doubt very much that Justice Ginsburg or Justice Breyer is a surprise to um, President, President Clinton. And I'm not, I even think that probably Anthony Kennedy is not a huge surprise either. And I wonder if Earl That's Warren good. was really that big a surprise to Dwight Eisenhower. I mean, Earl Warren was someone with a very progressive record to whom he owed a favor. When he appointed Brennan and he was looking for a Catholic Democrat, he might well have anticipated that that person wouldn't rule his way on every issue. So I think that there's sort of a myth of the Surprise. Let me I think just jump in on, on, on Warren had a deal because he threw the delegation to Eisenhower that he would have the first opening. No one expected Vinton, uh, who was it, anyway, to, 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 to dry, drop dead or something. I think that's a surprise. I mean, he was not the one they expected to retire first. Right. And uh, so <laughs> Warren goes to Eisenhower and says, okay. Mr. President, and he said, well, I didn't mean Chief Justice. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And Warren said, well, you said the first opening, and so. Uh, I think that the surprise factor comes when presidents um, get the blowback from public opinion that they're not expecting. When I, I edited Ronald Reagan's White House diaries, and he 
President Reagan loved Sandra Day O'Connor. She was from El Paso. She had been at the Lazy Bee Cattle Ranch, Southern um, Arizona. Nancy Reagan came from Arizona. It was his idea of a Western um, conservative with Sandra Day O'Connor. He loved her, Ronald Reagan. And he, in his diaries, was stunned to find the blowback within the ranks of the conservatives over the abortion issue, which Reagan said, I'm not going to worry about. Essentially, this, these people that are, are, are firebombing her are, are much more extreme than I even thought, meaning they, his own party people that were complaining about her and he had to stand up. He was very taken aback by that. And I think President Bush, a, George H.W. Bush, 41, um, was taken aback with uh, Clarence Thomas by the blowback he got from the civil rights community. I thought, think with that you know, feeling that he would be able to go through, that you wouldn't have the, all African Americans trying to, um, you know, to go after him and bury him. And, um, you know, that, that they, in, you know, so I think the surprise factors come when the presidents make their decision. That's obviously their best judgment or they wouldn't have picked them, but this sort of cultural wave that hits them. And, uh, and once it starts, it's like a wildfire. And uh, I think we're living in that kind of uh, can, culture. Can I just have to respond to this? Uh, two points about Thomas. Uh, the president was not surprised. Um, in fact, he pulls Thomas into his, to, to, to his house. I, he, I wasn't there, and neither was Thornburg uh, or Mrs. Bush. And he says, it says, this is going to be the roughest ride of your life. I'll stick with you if you stick with me. Are you, will you make that commitment? Yeah, President, he, President Bush knew this was well, going to be He awful. didn't know about tapes being coming out of a, a vendor's people were going to start looking at what movies you're watching and that. that he kind, knew, that, I'm, did, I'm that, telling that you, he pretty, knew it was going to be, he didn't know you know, Anita Hill was going to surface. If he knew that that was going to be the case, that he was going to put a, him through that, it wouldn't have gone through. I, mean, I agree with I'm, what you're saying. I'm, I'm there, I'm you, there, and no, I'm telling I'm, you. I'm interviewing knew. these people from the administration, and that's not well, what you better interview it. me. Well, <laughs> I, I'm dealing with the president himself. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want the audience to understand, you've just seen historical analysis in action here. <laughs> okay, uh, to the audience questions. To what extent... Do you think the candidate pool for justices has been reduced by a reluctance to be made a spectacle or to be borked? I'm sorry, could you, I couldn't hear you. To what extent do you think the candidate pool for justices has been reduced by a reluctance to be made a spectacle or to be borked? I don't think it's been <laughs> You don't think it's been reduced? Anybody? I don't think it's been decreased, not significantly. It might, it might be somewhat decreased to be on a, a federal court if you know that you know, every little thing you've done, and you, they do this to you these days when you're being proposed for the D.C. Court of Appeals, you're going to get fairly closely examined. But being on the Supreme Court, what always amazes me for not just this job but other big jobs is that people who do have something to hide still take them <laughs> and still get in so much trouble. Thank God from people like me. <laughs> Question for Mr. Gray, it says here. Are you arguing that judicial philosophy should not be a requirement for rejection, but is a legitimate basis for nomination by the president? Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it cuts both ways, and we may have a Democrat soon, and uh, uh, you can hold me to my words. Uh, we'll do that. <clears throat> How would you explain the reason why Republicans in the Senate gave their unanimous support for Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Steve Breyer and the contentious hearings that confronted just John Roberts and Samuel Alito. Well, I, I told you the reason. Um, those were, by, by Democratic standards, pretty conservative nominees. And they were suggested by Senator Hatch, who said, I can get them through. I think that's absolutely the reason. Um, and I don't think, if you actually read the transcripts of particularly the Ginsburg hearing, I don't think you'll find it any more uh, contentious, actually. The vote was not, you know, there were many more votes against both Alito and Roberts, although Roberts carried half the Democrats. Um, but the hearings were, you know, she was asked many, many, questions and on a lot of issues and she actually I surprised I was actually quite surprised when I went back and reread them at how many she answered she didn't answer some like death death penalty questions she said it was it was established law but beyond that she would not answer any questions 
but on m a lot of questions that you wouldn't think, she did answer. It was just early in the Clinton administration also, I mean, right? I mean, that was just the new president coming in, 93. So I think it may have been a different situation for her. 94 was for, when he lost the for, Senate. Yeah, election. but it was. But, 94 was when he lost yeah. the Senate, so. But I was thinking post-impeachment. Like, I wonder how you think she could have gone through after all that impeachment. Yeah, I think so. Good. One yeah. of the things, she was on the D.C. Circuit for 12 years, and I know a little, I don't want to bore people with how I know something about this, but I think it's true uh, that, um, and this is really quite extraordinary if you think about it, if, if it is true, but I think it's true that the two judges who, who voted most together when they overlapped on that court were Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Clarence Thomas. So she came off the Court of Appeals, which has a very different D.C. Circuit, has a very different uh, docket than the Supreme Court, but she came off that court with a very mainstream, if not conservative, uh, uh, 12 years. And she also had a voting <coughs> record on the D.C. Circuit that was closer to Bork. She voted more often with Bork than any other Democratic nominee. So you're not talking about, you, if you look at her earlier, off the court years, you could portray her as, if you want to, as a somewhat radical. You could try, anyway. But you can't with 12 years on the D.C. Circuit, and that's why she was a Republican favorite. Could Myers have been confirmed? No. no. Because of the conservative Republican? No, it's, it's worse than that. <laughs> it, doesn't, it, doesn't, from, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that she was conserv too conservative. Some recent commentary, well, she was, they, or they, no. they, they withdrew because they didn't think she was conservative enough, or they withdrew because she was too conservative. No, she, she wasn't qualified. I mean, she wasn't, no. she wasn't up to the level. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, she could have been presented as a pal, um, but unfortunately, because of the, of the, uh, of the tradition that, that, that for Professor Coleman has talked about, that you almost need to be a, an appellate judge, um, and you certainly do need to be an appellate judge to understand the, uh, the, to go through the grilling that, that the Judiciary Committee is now used to giving. Mm. And if you can't do that, if you can't perform at that level of scholarship, which she wasn't trained for, nor would Powell have been, um, then I think you, you can't make it. And that's I don't one agree of the, with you. You don't agree with me, good. I, think that, I think that Lewis Powell could have, uh, could have, and could have gotten through that kind of a grilling, but I do not think she could have. And the questionnaire that she filled out for the Judiciary Committee was the most deficient document of its kind that I have ever seen, and I've probably seen hundreds of them. I mean, you cannot fill out a questionnaire like that. Imagine if you had somebody applying for a job as anything who said, well, I got an honorary degree, but I can't remember when. I was on such and such a board, but I don't know what years. I can't answer that question other than with a formulaic one phrase answer, even though I know the question was just for me. And I, I, I mean, it was a, an astonishingly deficient document. And the fact that, and I know Ted Olson agrees with me on this, the fact that she was allowed to submit it to the Judiciary Committee suggests to me that there were people within the administration who were sandbagging her because somebody should have said to her, don't do that. That's a rough draft, the roughest of rough drafts. You can't do that. Let me try another question about uh, federal judges. The conversation about surprise <coughs> speaks to approval, approving only long-term federal judges. Might there be advantages for diversity? Might there be advantages? advantages for diversity? There are lots of advantages. Okay. So you're not saying that one should approve only long-term federal judges? No, I don't like okay. that idea. I, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's too limiting to, have, to limit the pool to Good. appellate judges. And, uh, but I don't think it's... Again, Professor Collins, I don't think it's conservatives who've done this. I mean, the criticism, one of the major criticisms of Thomas is he only served 16 months. Right. I think George Mitchell would have been a great Supreme Court justice. Would a Republican-controlled Senate have approved the Bork nomination? Mm -hmm. I think yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. And it wouldn't have, it, he wouldn't have, First of all, his hearings wouldn't have been September. They would have been earlier. 
they wouldn't have gone on for whatever it was, 13 days. Larry Tribe wouldn't have been able to present the cases against him as a sort of a huge, enormous thing. Um, and uh, he would have had a lot more sympathetic treatment from more Republicans on the committee. So there, the whole sort of atmospherics would have been different. And the Scalia and uh, Rehnquist Chief Justice nomination hearings before the Republicans lost control, though contentious, are fine, right? Fine. I mean, they, the candidates get approved. Yeah. yeah. OK. Do you believe the president has more legitimate discretion to choose than the Senate has to approve or reject? Well, I, I'll repeat my answer, yes. I think the president's got the constitutional obligation and, you know, opportunity uh, to nominate by himself. And then, you know, the, then the Senate has to reject or not. But, but the president has a lot more leeway in this than, uh, than the Senate. And I think that was designed by the framers. And one of the th points is, if you don't like what a president's doing, that all gets thrown in to when he's up for re-election. Okay. This is an interesting one. By what process could a sitting Supreme Court judge be removed from the bench? For ill health, mental or physical malfeasance, uh, carrying out, not carrying out his or her duties? Anybody? By what, by what, how could a, a sitting Supreme Court justice be removed? Well, someone help me out with the history. Who was it? Sam and Chase, big fight, um, and it's never been tried again. Um, I think it has to be, you know, uh, with, with great difficulty. Is the, is very the difficult. Issue. I think yeah. it has to be huge. Well, the kind of malfeasance that, that, that Fortas would might have been uh, subjected to uh, charges of. I mean, high or, crimes and misdemeanors. Yeah, I mean, very, very high standard. And there uh, is nothing in the Constitution, I don't think, that says just because you're sick, you get you have can be removed. I don't know what the statute says about the, you know, whether there's anything to be done for the Supreme Court. You can remove people from the lower courts under the, a very elaborate procedure. Um, but historically, when people get very infirm, they they send an emissary. I think it was, I can't remember who the justice was who was sent to tell Holmes, I think it was, that he was too old, that he was getting a little dotty and he had to leave, the time had come. And whoever it was, and I can't remember, said, and a dirtier day's work has never, I've never done. But final, there, there have been several who've done that kind of work. Final question. Lessons, lessons from the, this experience over the last 30 or 40 years. If you were sitting down with, with a party leader talking about nominations for the Supreme Court, the kind of per person should be nominated, the kind should be avoided. What, what are the lessons of you, all as expert analysts of this process, what have you learned? I think the, the vetting process has begotten so tough in politics and the court and that you really have to scrutinize who you're gonna put up for nomination. It's not good enough anymore that it may, it's a political fit, uh, that it kind of, uh, they, an individual is a friend or uh, is it maybe a bipartisan appointment. All those considerations, I think now it's just vetting, 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 that um, you really don't wanna get blindsided um, by uh, picking somebody and have this, the media scrutiny process boomerang back on you and you end up um, being damaged, your administration gets damaged, you have a black guy, you've gotta go back to the well. It seems to be a, the classic way now to put your, um, whatever party's in power to, uh, you know, to be kind of taken down a peg. It's not by coincidence, I think Bork at the same time with Iran Contra, William Luchtenberg wrote the great book In the Shadow of FDR by 1980, he started getting in a shadow of Ronald Reagan and there was an, a, a blowback attempt to kind of stop all of that and the, the Supreme Court nominations are the blowback moments in each administration. And the, a corollary to that is I think the, that it matters a lot to legacy. Uh, arguably, the current presidents, and one has to go to the Bush Library at Southern Methodist University, say what are his accomplishments as president. People are gonna talk about Homeland Security not being bombed after 9-11, et cetera the bullhorn moment, but I think probably Supreme Court um, nominations for the conservatives are the big thing that he accomplished. So your presidential legacies are being really looked at a lot now as in this closely polarized country of if you can get the, your person through and if they are either continuing of a more liberal agenda or are they 
uh, hard right. And the abortion issue, of course, Rover's Wade, as, as um, Sandra Day O'Connor knows well as anybody, it's just growing in this sort of litmus test status. Professor Conan, lessons learned. I really wish that we didn't expect all of our Supreme Court justices to have spent time on the federal circuit courts of appeal. And I would say in response to that, it's not the conservatives, as I said before, who've gone this trend. I think it's both parties will do this because it is safer. And it's it easier. Is, and you, you've had the vetting. The process goes through at least once before, sometimes twice. And you are going to you are going to feel safer, notwithstanding the fact that both Bork and Thomas had been appellate judges, but you're going to feel safer. And the, the pressure pushes you in that direction. Nina? Yeah. Well, I'm not a politician, so I, I'm not sure. But I think in some respects, if you had somebody who had been thoroughly vetted, who didn't have a judicial record, you might be safer too. But it takes more, more work, and it is a little more of a high wire act. And the last analysis, I still think if you really consult the other party at all in a serious way, you may not wish to. I mean, George W. Bush wanted a kind of person on the Supreme Court and got more or less what he wanted, I think, in, the, in Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, that the Democrats were not going to basically agree to. So. That's off the table. But if you aren't as committed to one side or the other, if, if you have a, a less uh, dedicated, perhaps is the right word, adjective view of it, then you have a little wiggle room. And you, you can give a little. And you won't have, I think you, your chances of not having that kind of a spectacle are better. But that's the only thing I can come up with. That's enough. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your patience.